So welcome everybody to today's webinar. Uh, thank you for uh, making time in your busy schedule to join us for what I what I hope will be a, a lively and informative discussion about um, a pretty hot trending theme this, these days. Um, uh, of course, talking about the metaverse. Um, and specifically, how does that, um, what does the metaverse banking look like uh, going forward? So we've got um, a number of questions uh, prepared to, to run through with uh, the panel today. Uh, I'll be the moderator for today uh, to guide uh, guide us through the uh, the, the session. Uh, we're going to have about um, um, a, a short intro of each of the panelists. Then we're going to get into the questions for about 40 minutes. And um, we'll spend about uh, hopefully 10 minutes or so at the end uh, addressing any questions that you have. Um, so feel feel free to put your questions in the chat or in the Q and A box, and we'll uh, we'll address those uh, in the last ten minutes of the meeting, of the of the webinar. So, without further ado, um, maybe just one last thing: if you're joining uh, as a participant of the webinar, uh, please feel free to put in the chat where you're joining from. It's always nice to see uh, which which countries people are attending from, uh, to get a, a good sense of who's here. So thanks a lot, and let's get underway. Uh, for the introductions to the panelists, uh, we're going to just follow um, Alaska Mutani, uh, Ms. Mutani Mutovni, uh, Mutonvi, my apologies. Uh, if you could please uh, kick us off with the, the introductions. All right. Uh, hello, everybody, and thank you for having me on this panel discussion on this intriguing topic on metaverse banking. My name is Mutoni Mutonyi. So I've had a very exciting and unusual career path, which has exposed me to very interesting experiences. And with the speed at which the world is evolving, including the, the discussion that we're about to get, to get into about the metaverse, I'm actually looking forward to even more exciting career experiences going forward. One of my earliest jobs was in a manufacturing company in the USA. However, I've spent most of my career in banking. And because I enjoy trying new things, I've held roles in several different departments in three distinguished Kenyan banks. The, the departments include corporate banking, finance, consumer banking, and project management, where I was responsible for establishing branches and ATMs in, the, in two banks where I've worked. I've also been in product management, and I'm currently heading IT innovation and research at Equity Group. And just to mention that as we continue this discussion, the, ex, the opinions that I express are my own opinions and not those of my employer. Thank you, Matthew. Thanks, Mutani, and I promise I'll get the pronunciation of your full name correctly next time. Uh, thank you for your introduction. Uh, Mr. Uh, Abdul Haram, Raham, uh, Rahman is um, um, is not able to join at the beginning of the meeting. Hopefully, he'll be able to join us um, in a, a part way through. So I'm going to pass it over to Danish. Over to you. Hello, everyone. I hope uh, you're doing good and keeping safe. So just a quick introduction. My name is Danish Jamal Khan. I'm a banker by profession and associated with banking industry from last uh, 16 years. I've worked in multiple geographies, starting from Pakistan, United Arab Emirates, and now I reside in Qatar and work for uh, one of the uh, domestic banks in Qatar. Uh, I'm a strategy practitioner. I work in strategy function. And uh, in parallel, I am uh, also pursuing my higher studies from uh, one of the business schools in Paris uh, named uh, ISM, International School of Management. Uh, I'm not a technology expert, but uh, I cannot ignore and avoid a technology because we all live in an era where uh, we are literally bombarded by new technologies, new uh, uh, business models, new concepts. So it's my passion to learn about technology and how technology is impacting the world of finance and in a broader perspective. As far as metaverse is concerned, I think it's one of the fascinating subjects of discussion and uh, we simply cannot avoid it. If you want to uh, read an article, or I mean, the moment we open the uh, World Wide Web, we, we, we are bound to see few articles on blockchain and uh, metaverse. So I'm looking forward for this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Danish. Um, all right, Khaled, over to you. Hi, everyone. I'm Khaled Naseba. I work at Burgan Bank Kuwait, uh, financial institutions department. I've been there for three years. Um, my experience in blockchain started in 2017 when I... Uh, when the craze around it really was just out of control and the prices were soaring. Um, I saw an opportunity there and got into, I built a mining operation. Um, I've done my studies, gotten random certifications, and I've ended up doing random freelance consulting for whether it's individuals or a couple of random entities, just 
how to approach the blockchain space, how it applies to you as a company, um, and how it can add value to your customer value cycle. I look forward to this panel and thank you for having me on. Super, thanks Khaled. All right, uh, George, over to you. Yes, uh, good afternoon. My name is George Sebastião. Um, I'm Portuguese Canadian. Um, I've been in Middle East for around 25 years. And uh, during those years, I've spent about um, 35 in IT, 22 in cybersecurity, and about seven years in blockchain. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here to discuss this interesting topic. But I also would like to note as well that uh, things like uh, digital twins and metaverses or virtual worlds have been with us for more than 10 years. I think what is interesting is the new combinations of uh, technologies and business models that I think are a little bit more revolutionary. So I think this will be an interesting topic uh, to address. Thanks a lot, George. Good to see you again. Uh, all right, Alan, over to you. Thanks, Matthew. Um, good afternoon from sunny Dubai. My name's Alan Hewitt. Um, uh, an interesting factoid, I came to Dubai when I was four years old in 1962. Yes, I'm that old. Um, my background has been very much in the IT space. I've worked for large internationals such as Cisco, um, being very much customer focused, looking at what the customer needs from IT and then how the customer utilizes IT. And uh, in the discussions in the run-up to this uh, webinar, we started to recognize that the metaverse is only an extension of, of the evolution of, of services to the customer. I can remember when I was just 16, 17, 1974, I got my first bank account. And then the changes that has happened, it's taken the customer more and more and more away from from the engagement environment of the businesses. And I think the metaverse is, is really now going to turn that round. And I think the metaverse now is more about customer intimacy. How do we reach out? How do we touch? How do we communicate? How do we bring value to the customer? Um, and just for reference, this month, it's the metaverse month in Dubai, and we've got nonstop uh, exhibitions, conferences, and uh engagement with all the uh, senior movers and shakers across both the crypto, the uh, blockchain and the metaverse um, business worlds. Um, thanks, Matthew. So looking forward to seeing you in Dubai uh, in a couple of weeks time. So I'll be, I'll be there from the, the ninth. Uh, as, you can, as you can see, it's sunny. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and for a change, we have sun in Belgium as well. So that, uh, that oh, right. uh, but, uh, but I'm sure the temperature is much more um, comfortable there. 26. 26. Yeah. We're around seven or eight degrees here. So, but uh, maybe just a short <laughs> intro for myself. Um, I'm uh, so Matthew Van Eekirk. I'm the, the co founder of a company called Settlement. Um, I've spent about uh, 12 years of my career in the banking sector, um, doing a number of different things, uh, doing digital transformation in banking. Also, were uh, for, for a couple of years, I was the platform innovation uh, manager for. Um, a retail brokerage platform in Belgium. So looking at the digital transformation and, and getting into all kinds of new technology trends and, and trying to define how uh, the bank or the broker in that case can uh, deal with new technology. So uh, quite a lot of experience in the financial services sector. Uh, in 2016, I, I started Settlement together with my co-founder, Roderick, um, with a simple ambition, and that's to make it easy for everyone else to build really good stuff on blockchain tech. Um, so we're a uh, a blockchain platform as a service company. And um, what we have included in our, our platform, are a lot of the, the, let's say the tools required to make metaverse work. Um, so if we're talking about NFTs or, or other digital assets, uh, then uh, our, our platform is designed to make it easy to, to populate the, um, uh, the metaverse with valuable assets. Um, so that's a short intro for me. And once again, very happy to have um, all the panelists here today. And very excited uh, to have all the, the participants that have joined and uh, looking forward to a, a great discussion about the topic of metaverse and banking. Um, all right, so we're going to kick it off. First question we have for today, and I'll put this to the panel. Um, so what are the opportunities for banks in a metaverse future? Um, it's a kind of a broad question, but let's, uh, let's go to you, Alan. I think you've got some ideas. Maybe you touched a little bit on your intro, but uh, please go ahead. 
Yeah, the met- the metaverse. What is the metaverse? The metaverse is, an, uh, from what I'm seeing, is an immersive environment where you can experience uh, intimacy um, with the customer and or services that um, that either you're purchasing or and or delivering. And what I'm seeing in real terms is is an, is is not a revolution, but it's an evolution. Yes, it's new technology. Yes, the 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 innovative thinking that's coming along with avatars and all the various other bits and pieces. Uh, sorry, bits and pieces. We've seen Second World uh, uh, 10, 15 years ago. This is now an evolution of that. What I do see the changes or the, or the metaverse will, will, will drive changes in, in terms of what the digital world, how the digital world inv- influences the, the, the physical world and how, you know, will we have any any bank branches at all or will the banking system be, just be totally virtual? And I suspect that's probably the way it's going to be. Um, the challenges are, uh, you know, how does the full bandwidth of our potential customer base use this technology? How simple is it? How informative is it? How secure is it? Um, there's there's many, many, many questions to be answered. Um, but I think the opportunities for uh, one of the large corporates I'm working with, it's a big multinational. It has uh, um, 70 companies. It's based in, in the Middle East. They're currently assessing what does metaverse mean to them? What does it mean to their brand? What does it mean to their operations? What does it mean across all the different verticals and the business services that they that they manage and deliver. I think the metaverse is, is, is a massive opportunity, but I think you've got to think through logically as to what you want to achieve with it and then build on something or else you're going to get a lot of uh, uh, spe- specification, driving innovation, driving change, and you probably won't be able to nail the jelly to the wall. I think you. I think. I think it's. Um, it's. It's. It's a very innovative platform. It's very forward thinking, but I think we've really got to think. Be structured in the way that we want to use it. Great. Thanks for that, Ellen. Uh, Mutani, over to you. You want to share some thoughts on this topic? Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Matthew. Yeah, I agree with Alan when he said that the metaverse uh, it won't be like some big bang thing that will happen. It's actually will just actually evolve into the metaverse. And so when I think of the metaverse, I think of it as an enhanced internet. It's our experiences will be enhanced a lot more that, <laughs> that we will actually now be living in the internet. We liked the internet so much, it transformed our lives. Now we just go back in and, and, and live there. A lot of our times will be spent there. So the metaverse is truly changing how we look at financial services in so many different ways. Digital assets like land, clothes, and sneakers, they're being traded in the metaverse already. Concerts and fashion shows are being held in the metaverse. So December last year, I read that Nike not only bought a virtual sneaker company, but it also filed several trademarks that indicate its intent to make and sell virtual Nike branded sneakers and clothes. Walmart has also made similar filings. They filed for a digital currency, a digital token, and virtual merchandise. So these are all indicators that these and several other companies that I've not mentioned, are, they are starting to sell their traditional products on the metaverse. So they, or, or if they're not already, they plan to. And they also want to protect their IP in the virtual world. So trade is happening in the virtual world, in the metaverse. So in the physical world, uh, where the world that we're used to living in, banks facilitate trade. Banks like to go where trade is happening so that they can facilitate the transmission and exchange of money. So inevitably, banks will determine with time, maybe some already have, but with time, banks will determine how to facilitate trade in the metaverse. Thanks, Matthew. Uh, yeah, thanks. So maybe uh, uh, if that's, it's an interesting outlook, yeah, the role that banks will play in facilitating transactions going forward in, in the metaverse. Uh, and I guess we can also ask, are, are they needed in the metaverse? That's another way to look at it, but maybe more controversial. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but Khaled, uh, maybe you want to add a few words? Yeah, just to add on to what Alan and um, and, and uh, Matoni said. Um, so first, uh, I think the big opportunity here is in uh, KYC and authentication, um, digital signatures. Um, I know that Personally, when we open up an account with uh, from bank to bank, a Nostra or Hostra account, for example, eighty percent of the procedures are are solvable with digital signatures and with smart contracts, and this would automate and save a lot of time. Um, I think for all companies, not just banks, internal internal uh, an internal metaverse within the company 
for meetings, for um, cooperation between departments, um, shared drives. For example, a, company, a, a bank as large as JP Morgan that's operating from Singapore to California, having all their things on, having their shared drive, having their um, network on an actual blockchain rather than a traditional server will also be a very beneficial thing for them. Um, so I think there's just a lot of different opportunities that, that can that, that are available for the banking sector and for all corporations in general. Yep. Okay, cool. Thanks. All right. So we talked in that one a little, maybe a little bit higher level about the broader transformational, uh, potential broad, um, broad transformational impact of metaverse. But I really want to zoom in if we can a little bit. And, and you know, what do you see as, uh, maybe I'll go to the next slide. So what do you see as really high potential uh, use cases um, for, for banking products in, in metaverse? Mutoni, back to you. Yeah, thanks, Matthew. Uh, so to, to dive a little deep on real potential use cases for banks in the metaverse, let me just first begin by laying a, a foundation. So in December last year, Snoop Dogg, a Snoop Dogg fan, he paid $450,000 to purchase land that is next to Snoop Dogg's virtual property, not real property, virtual property. He paid $450,000 or the equivalent of I also read that in Decentraland, which is a virtual pla platform, a virtual world, there's a plot that recently sold for $2.4 million or it's equi equivalent in cryptocurrency. So you see virtual real estate uh, sales are skyrocketing. So the, the two examples I've given you are probably the extremes, but prices have, consider have considerably grown from an average of maybe $100 for one plot last year in January to about $15,000 in December of last year. So there's a rapid growth and there was a rapid growth in the fourth quarter when another platform that's called Sandbox was started. So with that foundation laid, let's go back now to the physical world. So I told you what's happening in the virtual world, let's go into the physical world. In the physical world, as it is now, we, we are all aware that people can get mortgages if you want to buy property, right? If you need to buy a house or a commercial property, you can go to the bank and they'll give you money to purchase that. So I actually see an opportunity there to finance virtual real estate in the metaverse so you can buy real estate in the metaverse from a loan from a bank that's a potential use case actually it's not even uh, in theory there's a company that i heard about called terra 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 zero technologies it's offering loans to people who want to acquire virtual land and homes they already are doing it apparently so you know in the in the in the metaverse a title deed the 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 document that okay, it's not a document, but what what you lay claim to in the metaverse as as you owning that property is an NFT and an non fungible token. So what can what could potentially happen is a bank could finance the purchase of real estate in the metaverse and then use the NFT as the, the same way they would use a title deed in the real world. Yeah. So that if a customer does not pay, then the NFT works as the collateral. And all this can be handled using the using smart contracts that are available on the blockchain. And actually the process I think is a lot more efficient <laughs> than it is now, where there's no, you know, there's no paperwork moving around in the virtual world. It's all handled through smart contracts and NFTs and very nicely handled on the blockchain. But then it's one thing to note though is that in, if you're going to finance real estate in the metaverse, it can't be based on speculative investments. So applicants must be able to present a business case detailing how they will use the money to buy real estate and then also make money from that virtual real estate that they're buying. And then I'm sure the question on people's minds now is like, how would you make money then on virtual real estate? There are several ways you could do that. You could participate in games or you could uh, use your virtual real estate to, for events like fashion shows, people having fashion shows or concerts, these kind of things, or just charge people for being on your virtual real estate. So it really isn't a mortgage per se, it's a commercial loan because you're proving, you're starting a business really, because you're saying, I want this, give, give me money to purchase this virtual real estate and I will make money off of this virtual real estate in this way. That's a business case you would have to present to banks. So banks are already quite adept at underwriting loans for uh, physical assets and for commercial loans. This, they've been doing it for hundreds of years in the physical world. So that's a, if, if a bank would take up this opportunity, they would have to develop the competency of underwriting loans uh, for the virtual world. 
There are several other use cases. That, that's the one I, I saw as the most immediate use case, but there are several others. I mean, in the, in the virtual world, what's potentially going to happen is that education, entertainment, all sorts of things that happen in our lives can happen in the virtual world. And one use case you could think of is if a person is in Europe and, another, and, and a trainer is in Africa, the African could actually train the European on a hands-on skill, think even like a surgeon, a surgeon skills. Those could be trained virtually and taught virtually. And so, you know, all those need to be paid for. Basically, what I'm saying is there's potential for all the products that exist in banking now to exist in the metaverse. It's just that they will be so digitally transformed, they, they may not actually look quite the same. Right. Yeah, really fascinating going from a uh, collateral uh, using yeah getting loans to building businesses to training lots of lots of really concrete use cases. Uh, Danish, how about you? Do you have uh, ideas on what you see as the some high potential use cases for products uh, in the metaverse? Yeah, thanks, Matthew. Thanks, Muthani. Also, I think you have touched upon a few very interesting aspects of what banks can do in the metaverse. So uh, I also think you have quite comprehensive, comprehensively covered the product perspective. So let me just uh, just divert from the product perspective. Let me talk about other use cases, such as uh, let, let's talk about marketing. Let's talk about brand. Uh, I personally feel because banks are always conservative, banks are somewhat risk covers. So they may not directly jump into better words in, in form of uh, uh, in form of products or in form of uh, uh, offering the lending facilities, maybe during initial days they will they will be in, they will they will want to discover what metaverse is. Uh, just just uh, it's worth mentioning that there's no one metaverse. What is metaverse? Uh, yeah. There are there are multiple definitions of it. There are multiple platforms for metaverse. So banks will first enter into the discovery phase. They will explore what metaverse is. They will, they will try to deep dive into uh, understanding whether there are any monetization opportunities in the metaverse. And then uh, the, they, they, they will probably adopt the brand perspective that, okay, if even in the initial days, if we are uh, unable to introduce some, some direct products in the metaverse, let's be there. Let's, let's be there with a brand. Let our customers understand that we are there. And uh, one more important point. I mean, I just want to correlate it with a, uh, with, a with an example of blockchain. When blockchain came, uh, obviously during initial days, banks had no idea, right? But they, then they started the discovery phase. And many, many financial services organizations, they have just uh, uh, consulted and contracted uh, one of the technology companies just to do the pilot transaction. I'm aware about one bank in, in, in Middle East market where uh, they have just, in 2017, they have just done one pilot transaction on a blockchain platform. And I'm pretty sure the cost of doing this pilot transaction was somewhere around $100,000 to $150,000. And since 2017 to date, they are unable to scale it up. So the point is they, they invested in the technology, they learned about the technology, and then it was probably not making much sense for them that they are probably the use case that they have adopted. So then they went silent. So for me, uh, I think banks will start small. They will enter into the metaverse world just to be there because uh, banks obviously have their own KPIs. They have to show to the external world that they are one of the innovative organizations. They have to show to the, the uh, 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 investors that look, uh, our brand is there. Uh, are, I mean, uh, for, for, for customers, uh, they are there because uh, they want to make their brand visible. All in all, it's, an, it's a very interesting space, space. It's evolving, it's evolving fast. And I think uh, banks will continue exploring it initially from the brand perspective. Then in the next phase, they will think about the low risk products like payments, like something which is a small. And then in the longer run, they will try to, uh, try to identify monetization opportunities in terms of lending products. Uh, having said that, it's not easy. It's not easy. And I'm sure once we uh, move ahead into this discussion, we'll, we'll broadly cover the challenges and why uh, it's not easy for banks to penetrate into this market. So that's what my thought is up to now. Yeah, yeah great. And uh, Matthew, Matthew, can I just sure. say something? Go Danish, it, 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 it's, really, it's really interesting because I totally agree with you. And I think the place where you're going to see banks really getting into this is smart contracts in the back office. You're already seeing the likes of HSBC doing very high volume uh, smart contract trials and testing. Uh, the, 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 the thing for me as I, I can, the customer I was mentioning before, they're looking at how to automate uh, back office services 
uh, across 70 major global brands and then be, you know with with digital contracts and with smart contracts and also looking at how that affects the cost of of those banking transactions they're even trying to assess what 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 their future bank partner should be and that's been a big question that was asked by uh, at board level only last week um so uh, yeah i think you're totally right the, the i think you're possibly going to see a new type of bank that's going to pop up out of the crypto uh, digital currency space coming into the banking space, possibly even being taken over by the banks, or possibly the banks then partnering with these with these new companies to reduce their exposure, but to give them access. All right. Thanks for that, Alan. Yeah, there's. Uh, I think. Uh, thanks, Dennis. It's kind of a roadmap you laid out there for anyone in the banking sector on uh, what steps to take <laughs> or possibly to take. And Alan, thanks for joining in on that one. Yeah. I think uh, the question that will will be posed, poised, or let's say, should be um, raised then is like, uh, if if banks are going to take several years to get going with this, um, will they be too late? But maybe we can come back to that uh, on a, at a later stage. But um, looking at the next question we have, so what initiatives? So we we've talked about um, a broader impact on banking and in and metaverse, and then uh, looked at some specific use cases, and and I think a couple were mentioned already, but. Are there others in the panel that see initiatives already emerging in metaverse banking? So uh, with that, maybe I'll, I'll jump over to uh, to Khaled, and then I'll come back. I'll come over to you, George, if you want to add something. We've kept, you haven't had a chance to jump in yet. Um, yeah, so thank you, Matthew. Um, so first of all, we see JP Morgan opened up uh, the Onyx Lounge in Decentraland, um, the platform that was previously mentioned. Um, exactly how they're going to approach that i think it's looking like they're that's a setup for maybe a branch um and decentraland seems to be the absolute biggest platform so far for the larger corporations um something interesting actually equibank um has a presence in a platform named poker city which is just another metaverse where they actually have virtual debit cards in the form of nfts um used to spend in that platform but you can also use that same bank account to spend in the real world and i think the blending of the real world with the virtual with the, the metaverse is the future and and the way that the that we're going to get the banks involved in this yep. thanks for that yeah of course there's big announcements from uh, jp morgan and a few others now about uh replicating a physical model in the digital world. Um, uh, George, do you have um, any uh, examples you would like to, to highlight? Yes, I mean, I do believe that um, the world of banking has been transforming itself and shrinking and disappearing as we know it. I think everything started a little bit with the ATM machine and then we had the I was CTO of Huawei for six years where things like virtual teller machines, which is kind of an initial physical replacement for the bank as a branch, and I think metaverse is just the next step in, in that transition. So that really means the services that the bank is today offering in the physical world through a virtual teller machine are simply going to be offered in the metaverse. So they're going to first focus on reaching community and their existing customers. And they're trying to expand, obviously, to customers that they have not uh, serviced before. However, as you know, in the digital world or digital the world of digital assets there's quite unique uh, opportunities that are only from that world and this includes things like for example DeFi, which is the centralized finance um, there is also obviously custody of digital assets insurance of those digital assets loans against those digital assets which was partially mentioned by Anthony as well so I do believe that it's not just about reaching the customer with existing services through another distribution channel. It's also about introducing a whole new services as they apply to these digital assets, helping protect them and helping add a, you can say, institutional approach uh, towards serving that new customer base. Of course, all of this has to be done, not just in the virtual world, but also through regulatory approach, as you know, most yeah. are extremely regulated and they can simply not just approach without first contracting this in the case here will be like a central bank um if you're in saudi it would be sama cbb and bahrain and so on uh, which have to kind of give a nod to move ahead but i think the necessary 
elements for regulation are already in place, especially with the birth of virtual banks in the region. Now, if we look at Europe, there's over 50 operating virtual banks, but in the Middle East, we have about three or four, but it's about to explode. Metaverse is just adding one extra distribution element. The beautiful about this whole new environment is that we'll be able to mix and match and create completely new business models that were not there before. And all this is basically going to serve is to accelerate um, existing business. Now, when we look at NFTs, NFTs themselves in the digital world serve obviously two primary elements. One is the identity element, which is extremely element uh, important in the area of trust. And the second one is the element of creating various asset classes that we can break, we can fractionalize, and we can identify as a unique value, or that happens to be real estate as a property, or that could be, for example, um, painting or digital content that you're trying to monetize. And I think the banks have a vested interest in starting to look at the, this new class of digital assets. The last part I think is very important is I think the banks have basically forgotten about, you can say the unbanked for lack of a better term. So I, I think I see this as an opportunity for the traditional banks to start serving their forgotten. Now, whether they do it directly or they do it through a more agile subunit um, as it's been done by several banks in um, Europe and Germany, as an example. So it means instead of, because you know traditional banks just move too slow. So sometimes it's just yep. better to be part of a new unit that only addressing this new market and there's just a division of them, but it can move at a much more accelerated pace um, because you need a completely different skill set uh, to be able to develop products and services as they address in the metaverse. I think the last element that I find is very important is about access and user friendliness. One, um, ATMs were firstly introduced, for example, in Canada almost 40, 50 years ago. Uh, the experience was not so good for the average user, which was maybe in their 50s or 60s. They went back, right, rushed into the bank to update their bank book. So that really means that people were afraid about this new digital world approach. But today we're servicing a whole new generation that has already embraced this. It's the banks that have been slow at embracing these new delivery channels. So they just need to move and accelerate that pace as we go forward. Thank you. You raised something in there and we're taking a bit longer, so we'll try to speed up on the next question. But you really made me think there for a minute, George. I was, I was just imagining when you mentioned the unbanked and providing access. And uh, I wonder, and I just, I was wondering, do branches get replaced by like phone booths with, with, um, what, uh, with, with, uh, with VR goggles? And uh, anyone can jump in the, the phone booth, you know, that kind of a, well, anyways, just a thought came to mind when, uh, when you touched on the unbanked. And that's, uh, that's an, I think that's something that's not really explored at all uh, the, in the literature I've read and how metaverse might um, provide opportunities for the unbanked, you know, really interesting stuff. Um, we're going to move on to the next question. Uh, we, uh, George, also you mentioned a bit about uh, DeFi, and um, and I'm going to flip it over to Khaled. Um, so, how will DeFi evolve with the rise of metaverse? Um, so, let's look at the current DeFi landscape and how it compares to traditional centralized finance. So, at the moment, uh, if I want to take a ten thousand dollar loan, for example, as a retail customer, I have four to five banks to choose from. That puts the ball in their court where demand far exceeds supply, wherein the lender is the supplier. Um, with DeFi, I can go on a DeFi platform and find uh, 10,000 different opportunities to take a loan. So it now levels the playing field a little bit. But to move on, um, the internet currently in its state, it's, it's very limited inclusion of digital, digital assets in the DeFi world. So if I want to take a loan in DeFi, currently I have to put up collateral in the form of cryptocurrency. But if I want to put up an NF, a digital asset in like an NFT, for example, as my collateral, that's currently not really possible with, with most of the platform. Um, and I'm not I, sure I about- Khaled, that is possible already. There's something called NFTU loan which is doing exactly that. <laughs> but can you fractionize the NFT? That is correct. You can do that as well. And you can put, of oh. course, you, they do not give you 100% of your NFT, but you can collateralize depending on the popularity <laughs> of that NFT. 
up to 50 or 60%. It behaves exactly like real estate, but it's NFTs. Okay, I wasn't aware of that platform actually. But uh, to continue, actually, um, so right now the NFT landscape is uh, it's very new and there's very like the way things are going. It's uh, it's not necessarily how it's going to be in the future. So 20 years from now, if I want to uh, tokenize my the land deed to my house and put it on a blockchain and register on a blockchain and be able to use my house as collateral, I think the metaverse adds a lot of value in that because. It, it provides <clears throat> it provides a model for digital real estate. Now it's physical real estate, but tokenized and registered in a digital way, and it, it it gives an opportunity to offer an, a truly global financial services sector. Where and right now, if I want to offer up my if I want to get use my home as collateral, I cannot do that in Portugal. I cannot do that in Spain. I have to do it in my local economy. Whereas the metaverse will allow me to. Approach it globally. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, yeah, and I think that uh, uh, George uh, George's intervention there is also testament to how quickly the space is moving. I think uh, that's that's really something that's uh, exciting about um, um, the, the whole uh, technology space is what's what's you know known today is it can change tomorrow, and, uh, and what's not existing today can exist tomorrow. So it's a very rapidly evolving uh, technology space. Um, so we're all doing our best to stay up to date. Um, good. I would. Um, I'm going to jump to the next question. Um, what we've got coming up? Uh, where does blockchain fit into this picture? So I think we've we've had a couple comments throughout that are kind of putting uh, uh, links back to blockchain. But um, I'm going to ask. Um, um, let's say uh, so, George. Maybe you can share your views on this one. Uh, where does blockchain fit into this this metaverse banking future? Well, actually, it is already there because when we look really um, at the digital twin or um, virtual worlds, which has been with us for more than 10 years, the real biggest difference that is happening with the metaverse version that we have seen appear over the last uh, one year or so is that blockchain and uh, DeFi and uh, elements. So what we're really doing is that we are conversions, technologies, that were existing as separate technologies. So blockchain was one on one side, we had digital twins and virtual worlds on the other. And what is really happening with this new version of metaverses is that, and by the way, it's not just one metaverse, but there's many of them, which is, I think the integration of these metaverses is gonna be a major job, is the capability, and we have also multiple blockchains, so it's kind of a bit messy situation. So this integration of uh, multi-chain uh, environments uh, multi-DeFi protocols and being able to integrate the multiverse into the, not just the electronic banking, but e-commerce as well, is going to be key. So I think we should firm focus on the application of this integration rather just on the, on the visual aspects. So today we have very nice metaverses, but they really don't have any utility as a commercial utility. Is when you see the two uh, fusion together, that we really get benefit. But I do want to add one point that I think is extremely important. Today's metaverses perform extremely bad on a mobile environment. You understand you need a, a very powerful PC or so. The device of choice for every consumer, whether it happens to be in Europe or specifically Africa, is a mid-size to upsize uh, mobile. So metaverses have to really address that element to actually gain proper traction. Until that gets done, they'll be kind of a, they'll remain niche. And that proven because today when we go to most metaverses, what do we see? A few thousand people. It's a very light usage. We're not there in terms of mass adoption for everyone. All right, I'm gonna turn over to Muthoni and then over to Danish for, uh, for some more thoughts on where blockchain fits in this uh, metaverse banking future. Okay, so blockchain actually enables the transactions that happen in the metaverse. So if we think of the platforms that exist right now, like Decentraland and others, the metaverse, the, the meta, in, in those worlds, the, the currency of choice is cryptocurrency and blockchain is the foundation of all cryptocurrencies, right? So blockchain truly powers the metaverse. The benefit of blockchain is that it provides an immutable data store for all these virtual objects that happen. So therefore, given that foundation, blockchain is critically important 
for safe trading on the internet, on the metaverse, on this enhanced internet. So it's blockchain is actually really, really important. And what I like best about um, the use of blockchain is we've talked about how non-fungible tokens can be used to prove ownership of unique assets such as land on, on the metaverse. So it, for example, I had mentioned earlier that if you if you own land on decentral land, actually what you own is an NFT that indicates the land um, that you own in the metaverse, in this virtual land. And this NFT is on the blockchain and the blockchain is transparent, it's immutable. So I, now coming to put that in the real world. So we've, we've said, I've now explained why uh, how blockchain fits into the metaverse, but now bringing it in actually into the meta, into the physical world that we live in. And we've talked about, uh, I think it was George who mentioned the, the digital twins. There's actually immediate potential use case for uh, blockchain and NFTs in the real world, because what we could have is the real world replicated in the digital world, you know, we have a digital twin of the physical world. And then in that digital world, you have NFTs that establish ownership of land and houses and buildings that are owned in the physical world, which I think would make it a whole lot more efficient in establishing who's the owner of different assets. Thanks, Matthew. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Danish, how about you? Yeah, thanks, Matthew. Thanks, uh, everyone. So I, I must say it's uh, uh, shaping up as a very interesting discussion. Uh, let me take a step back uh, without going into the complications. I think Metoni have already summarized it well that it's blockchain that is too, that is critical for metaverse. I mean, it, it enables the metaverse. Uh, let me take a step back. So since years and years, we are hearing that blockchain is one of the disruptive technologies and blockchain is a technology technology with massive potential. And uh, I mean, initial days, uh, there was a lot of noise like blockchain will, will probably change the world and blockchain will uh, eradicate the poverty. And uh, there was a lot of noise around blockchain. And then a time came when this hype was uh, settled down, but then uh, no one realized like, uh, it was happening. I mean, uh, in bits and pieces, uh, in some cases, the large organizations, they were continuously into the journey of adopting the blockchain. Uh, but up, I mean, in, in parallel, we also know DeFi was growing. DeFi was growing uh, silently and, and, and it was making an impact. But I think uh, whatever we heard previously will probably turn out to be true now because metaverse is a different world. It is a, it is a new world. And it is blockchain that enables this new world. As uh, someone have already mentioned, like Decentraland, which is the which is the largest uh, metaverse play platform up to now, it's it's enabled through uh, uh, it's it's built on Ethereum blockchain. So I think blockchain, metaverse, DeFi, they go hand in hand. And I think Joe's have already made one interesting point. Like these technologies existed. Uh, since long time, but the true uh, disruptive potential of technologies when these technologies will converge and will shape up the new business models. Yeah, and I'm gonna I'm gonna stay with you for the next question as well, Danish. Uh, so, how far are we uh, from metaverse banking, and and what uh, regulatory challenges need to be overcome um, in in the process of going further? Yeah, uh, indeed, an interesting question. So I'll I'll. Uh, divide this question in two parts. First, how far, uh, how far are we from metaverse banking? Or in other words, how soon banks will enter the uh, metaverse space? So to be honest, I don't see it happening in the near future. As I have mentioned previously, banks will start the discovery and exploration phase, and they will, they will make a gradual entry into the metaverse world. Uh, they will want their brand to be there to, to tell to their customers, to tell to their investors, to tell to their shareholders that, look, we are one of the innovative organizations and we are uh, uh, embracing the uh, emerging and future technologies. So for next few years, I think this will be the name of, of the game. Having said that, there will be few exceptions, like the top digital players like JP Morgan, likes of DBS, likes of ING, and few more will, will probably approach metaverse more aggressively. And obviously then the, then the uh, major uh, population of banks will, will obviously be uh, slow to adopt metaverse. So I must say it, it's, it's still quite far. I don't see it happening in the near future. Uh, I mean, and there's a reason for it because uh, as I think Joseph previously mentioned, uh, banks are slow, banks are lazy, they're conservative. They are, they are working under, uh, under uh, stringent regulations. They have too many problems in hand. They have capital requirements. They have, they have to mitigate the risk. They have NPS, they have liquidity issues. 
uh, their, their technology is legacy, uh, their infrastructure is legacy, their mindset is somewhat legacy. So they are in the uh, legacy everything environment. Uh, uh, recently, I think just in FAB 2022, there was a, there was a survey, uh, I think from uh, Capstone Advisors, which was published by Financial Brand, which was more of a self appraisal for banks. Uh, you'll be surprised to know that 46% of the banks have mentioned that they are not even halfway through into their digital transformation journey. And only 5% banks have mentioned that they have either completed their digital transformation, to be honest, I don't know how, how can digital transformation be completed, and or they are somewhere near the digital transformation. So just imagine like almost half of the banks are not even 50% through into their digital transformation journey because they have many problems in hand. And talent is another major issue. I mean, there's a talent uh, crunch. Banks are not able to retain the talent because uh, talent and the, and the bright minds are probably, I mean, leaving the banking industry because of too many regulations and because of too many, uh, too much conservative environment, they are, they are heading towards FinTech and they're heading towards Big Tech. I'll not be surprised if uh, it will be FinTechs that will be uh, adopting or that will be uh, entering the metaverse world, metaverse world uh, far before uh, banks would do. Uh, let's let's move to the second part of the discussion, which is about uh, regulations. So uh, again, I'm not very optimistic that regulations uh, will come uh, uh, or metaverse related regulation will come soon uh, because uh, uh, let's take the bigger picture. We still don't have regulations around uh, artificial intelligence. Our AI is biased, and it is biased. I mean, there's no solution to it. We still don't have a we still don't have a problem. Uh, the, the solution to uh, AI, artificial intelligence, trolley problem. And I'm afraid I think we'll never be able to find the solution. Uh, uh, regulators are divided when it comes to regulations around uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, we still don't have, I mean, there are too many gray areas around uh, regulations uh, uh, about autonomous cars. So uh, as far as regulatory paradigm is concerned, there are too many challenges. And there's a, there's a, there's a, a phrase that we use in the technology circle, cultural lag. So uh, which, which essentially means that technologists, fintech players, big tech, they are far, far ahead when it comes to uh, 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 I mean, investigating and moving ahead with innovations and regulators are always few steps behind. And I don't blame regulators for that. They're not, uh, they're not born or they're not tuned uh, for a technology world. Their job is to ensure the financial stability in the economy. So banking is a 550 old, years old discipline. So regulators, bankers, they're tuned to be uh, op operate in the stable world, in a certain world. But all of a sudden, this technology proliferation and the advent of new and emerging technologies like artificial intelligence, robotics, blockchain, metaverse, uh, you name it, it is creating a lot of disruption. So I am not optimistic. I don't think uh, regulators are going to uh, come up with, with some organized and structured framework whereby banks can adopt the framework and can probably enter into the metaverse world in a very organized way. Yes, few banks will take lead. Few banks will uh, obviously find ways and means to enter the uh, metaverse space. It will happen gradually. Regulators will obviously uh, take some time to, to bring more clarity into the subject. And uh, it's not going to happen, uh, I mean, now or probably a few months from now or a few years, years from now. It will take time. Great. Okay. And Khaled, how about you? Do you have a thought on this topic as well? Uh, just to add to that, um, just because of the global nature of the metaverse, I think the biggest thing is going to be how governments decide to tax it and how uh, tax the, the digital <laughs> assets and how. I think that's going to yeah. be the biggest hurdle because um, yeah. all the other things is they're dealt with with the central banks. They're dealt with a lot of things, but the one thing that can never be escaped is taxes. And for example, in Kuwait, we don't have taxes. So that's a hurdle that doesn't exist. But how does a business in Kuwait operate with a business in the United States in the metaverse? How is, you know, so I think that's going to be the main regulate, the main hurdle in terms of regulation. Jurisdiction. That to be overcome. Jurisdiction. Correct. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, George, you want to add something in here? And I'll, 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 I'll uh, go oh, ahead. Uh, I think there is good news and bad news. The good news is that part of these regulatory challenges are being addressed already 
um, through the digital asset regulatory elements that are being appearing and under various um, regulatory like Wyoming and US, Miami, um, ADGM in Abu Dhabi, Bahrain, and the IFC. Um, however, there's of course many other challenges that remain and these challenges remain, for example, when we move to the metaverse, there's a whole new set of privacy and other challenges that come with any new technologies that get introduced. We created a group almost three years ago called XRSI.org, which stands for Extended Reality um, for Cybersecurity. And it was created in California and we've been doing and created a framework for cybersecurity and privacy. It's already in version 2.0. So now what we're trying to do is to get these uh, gaming, uh, banking, metaverse technologies to start looking at this uh, framework to understand where the issues are and how to address those issues. So I think we have addressed part of it, but with this new world comes a whole new set of challenges that we're going to have to address. I do believe that for the regulators, one of the best tools available to them is what we call the regulatory sandboxes that have been used in places like Bahrain. What this allows you to do is to say, okay, try it in a very limited way. We observe how it's moving. And then we make rules to address what you have created. So it's kind of an hybrid model that allows regulators to move in a two-step, one-step approach. And I think uh, this has been relatively successful as a way for regulators not to lose too much time and to catch up a little bit faster than they have done in the past. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Uh, we've seen a lot of good examples of regulatory sandboxes um, in major financial centers that have created a safe environment for experimentation and, and definitely a great advice to any regulator uh, regulatory body in the in the in the in the in the in the webinar today if um, if you're not if you don't have a sandbox check it out they're pretty cool to uh, to get innovation happening and get uh, talent coming to your your jurisdiction um I'm gonna pass this one on to to Alan Alan you've been rather quiet there for for the last uh, 20 minutes or so. <laughs> But let's uh, let's go to this one. So, how to get started when wanting to enter the metaverse as a financial business? I, th I think um, this is an interesting question because a lot of people are currently looking at that um, this 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 topic, this issue. And as uh, Jory has just said, it's it's regulatory, it's security, there's a whole raft of of drivers. But people are seriously saying, you know, what do we have to do to be there? The challenge I think you're going to see is a. Uh, is, is two parts to it. Metaverse as an environment to have an existence in, metaverse as an environment to trade in, and then metaverse as an environment to to, to run your operations through. So you start to look at you know, a couple of the big corporates that I'm working with, and they are, they, one of them in particular said, I, we've now got to change the core of our business. Our core of our business is now going to become a fintech business, it's going to be regulated under a banking structure, etc. And we're going to connect 70 businesses into that environment. The question was then asked, well, what does that presence look like across the 200 countries that they trade in, um, in a number of different businesses? Alan, I think we've, uh, we've lost you for a minute. Yeah. Everybody else, can you can? Oh, there we go. I think Ellen, you you dropped for a minute. Uh, are you back now? Business verticals from retail, from uh, etc. 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 The the is is a skill set is a skill set issue. Um, there is a dearth of uh, or lack of knowledge and skill sets that allow people to get to grips with what their systems that they've got today can do. And then to give people the insight to build a, a migration program to allow them to enter these new business environments. And I think that's the challenge. I, 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 and to go to your company name, Settlement, I think one of the first things you're going to see in the metaverse is, is settlement. The customer, one, one customer is looking at how he settles its contracts with all its different business relationships around the world. And as uh, Khalid said, the other issue is jurisdiction. So how do we in Dubai transact with the UK and, and, and the various other entities around the world? And where does the jurisdictional contractual uh, environment exist for those for those services? Today, it's, it's a peer-to-peer -peer type relationship. If we now exist in the metaverse, 
what 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 structural uh, regulatory and or legal frameworks do those do those um, do those businesses have? And it's interesting. We've we've been talking about NFTs. If you think about what people are describing, is an NFT is a deed, a deed of ownership, um, and you know, do we translate a deed's rules and regulations and translate that and say, well, an NFT is a deed? The biggest challenge is 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 is, is working out what your business plan looks for the next 150 to 200 weeks, and where does metaverse play in that? I think um, that's some interesting discussions. Thanks for that, Alan. Yeah, indeed. Uh, so I think, um, and I think we've had enough uh, good insights from Danish as well. I think the the, the first step is just um, starting with some some light, low level, easy experiments that are low risk as well, um, and then uh, find your way. And where can you add value in in uh, to the the users of a metaverse? Uh, that's where you should find business opportunities. So, yeah, easy start, and then but be be ready to move. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna. Just, Go to the last question. We're running close to the end here, but uh, the final question, and Mutani, I'd like to get your thoughts on this one. Um, so what are the main challenges to contemplate when entering metaverse with financial products? Yeah, thanks, Matthew. And I can think of a few, but uh, in the interest of time, I think maybe I'll focus on just my first four. Um, so I think the first one that I would highlight is a challenge of K KYC AML uh, counter-terrorist financing. This is the reason I see this as a challenge because if you're dealing with somebody who's in the virtual world, you actually can't see them, can't touch them. Uh, you, 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 you can't truly establish their identity because they're not with you. And so I see this as a challenge because do you, do you, know, do you truly know who they are because they're interacting with you in a virtual world? And on top of that, do you know if they're engaged in any undesirable activities such as money laundering or terrorist financing? Because, you know, as, as banks and for people who offer financial products, you don't want to be involved in those kind of things. So, uh, however, that said, I do think that although this sounds like a major challenge right now, Inevitably, we, we as human beings, we innovate and we figure things out really quickly. This challenge will be solved in a manner that will give financial institutions the confidence to know who they are dealing with in the virtual world. And more than that, it will also give regulators comfort. The, the regulators will be comfortable with the controls that banks and other financial institutions would have put in place to figure out whether they know that they're dealing with the right person in a virtual world. So that's the first one. The second one is related to the example I had given earlier. In the example I had given earlier, I had suggested that one of the products that banks can offer is to finance digital assets. You know, like the, when I talked about how land prices are growing in Decentraland, and if somebody doesn't have enough money, they could probably approach a bank and ask for that asset to be financed. However, the, the challenge with that, though, is in the virtual world as it is now. The, the value of those assets, the land, the house, whatever it is you're buying virtually, it's measured in cryptocurrency. So it might be, let's say, uh, just picking up a number from the air, it might be worth 500 Ethereum, for example. But Ethereum and other cryptocurrencies, we know their value crap fluctuates. So imagine if we lend as a bank, imagine if a bank were to lend um, a customer money to buy a land in Decentraland and then... Uh, Okay, Decentraland uses mana, not Ethereum. But supposing it was Ethereum. And so you're buying money in, uh, you're, you're buying assets that are measured in Ethereum and then the value of Ethereum drops by half in like two months. That creates a bit of a problem for banking. So that's a challenge that we'd have to overcome. A second challenge, uh, well, the third challenge I'm going to mention, which is related to uh, that second challenge I mentioned, is that the currency in the metaverse right now, the platforms that we're seeing, the Decentralands and the Sandbox, and there's another one Khalid mentioned that I'm not familiar with, but I'll look it up. Yeah, so all these um, different platforms and worlds, they operate in cryptocurrency. Now, many regulators, either they frown upon or they outright ban cryptocurrency. So this is a challenge to overcome, particularly if you're operating in a country where the, the regulator or the government has banned cryptocurrency. So how would you enable those types of transactions in the in the metaverse as the metaverse is defined right now. But again, like I'm saying, even like the, with the first uh, challenge I mentioned about KYC, we are humans, we are innovative, we quickly figure things out quick and, and we'll be able to overcome these challenges. And maybe one way to overcome this challenge of cryptocurrency and the, uh, the way it's banned by different governments and the way it fluctuates could be that maybe we can use CBDCs in the metaverse, the central bank digital currencies. Mm. Perhaps that's a mm. currency that could be used in the metaverse to overcome this challenge. I don't know where. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> finally, my final challenge that I'll mention is um, you see the metaverse is a decentralized world that is it is not controlled by any one entity. Yeah, and this was raised earlier when we were talking about regulation and trying to figure out what jurisdiction is. But you see, inside the metaverse, there are human citizens, you know, people like me with flesh and blood who are interacting with others that are not in the same country as them. So I could, in Africa, I live in Africa, in Kenya, I could be trading with someone in Russia, for example. My concern there, therefore, is um, how, how do we handle disputes? Supposing I have a dispute with a guy who's in Russia, uh, or about some trade transaction that happened in the metaverse, where do I go to handle that dispute? Can I go to a court of law and sue him in a court of law? Uh, if, we, if we did that, which court? Is it a court in Russia in, or in Africa? You know, that, that I just see as, a, as one of the other challenges. So yeah, those are the top four challenges I would mention um, with regards to entering the metaverse with financial products. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. If you don't mind, can I chip, chip in with probably a 10 seconds statement? Sure. Yep. Go ahead, Danish. Yeah. Uh, we're talking about challenges. I think uh, it's ambiguous. It's complex. Uh, yeah. We don't know uh, the, the depth of metaverse. We can only see the tip of the iceberg. We are just scratching the surface of metaverse. So I must say it's complex. Uh, I mean, we, we don't have a long term clarity about it. So that's the biggest challenge for now. All right. And we just uh, we are running a little bit over, but I want to take time to answer just one of the questions that came in. And I'm going to pass this to Khaled. Um, Khaled, the question from the audience was, uh, we've been talking in, in the session, we've been talking a lot about metaverse and, and NFTs, and we didn't kind of lay a groundwork or foundation about what exactly is an NFT. So one of the, the questions from uh, a participant in, in uh, was, uh, to, could could one of the panelists break down NFT? Uh, what is it exactly, and, and uh, so that everyone understands what we're talking about? So, how would sure, you so. define an NFT? Thank you, Matthew. So, NFT, non fungible token, is just basically a vert a digital asset. Now, it could be a, a physical or non physical. So, you can take a physical asset and tokenize the proof of ownership and register that on the blockchain. That's what the process of minting an NFT is. Um, in general, though, most a lot of them are going to be digital assets that are simply just. Um, it's now. It's it's the first. It's the first time you can actually prove ownership of a digital asset and give it real value. Um, and I mean that's basically. It's it's a very general question. Like. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but I think also the, there's, uh, I think Alan also and, and uh, Mutoni were, were referring to them as deeds uh, in, in the, what we look at deeds. So the, the ownership part, I think that's yep. totally it. So yeah, th thanks for that, Khaled. We're going to have to wrap it up um, now. Um, so I would like to thank everyone who joined today uh, to participate in the in the, the webinar. And especially a, a huge thank you to all the panelists for sharing your insights, your knowledge, and helping to overcome one of the biggest challenges in blockchain and metaverse which is, uh, is building a, a foundational base of knowledge. So as always in our, our webinars, we want to share knowledge, share experience, and we try to bring the best in the business around uh, to share that with you all. So thanks a lot for being here today and looking forward to talking to you soon. Thanks. Pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Thank you. Bye. Bye.